Hi, this is Toby Salgado. I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I build my business faster and better? Each week, I interview top producing real estate agents, coaches, and authors. I find out, I dig in, I find out how they did it, where they struggled, and how they overcame the obstacles that in, inevitably gets in front of all of us. And I did that so both you and I, so we all can reach our own full potential. If you want more of the tips and strategies we cover in this session, you're gonna to wanna to do two things. First, go to our site, superagentslive.com, and subscribe to the show on iTunes so that you don't miss any of the conversations we have in the future. And second, download my free ebook and learn how to stack the deck in your favor. Before we get going, let's hear from our sponsor. We all know the best kind of referral is one from our sphere or farm, but how do we stay top of mind? Now, most people, they take a three-pronged approach, right? They door knock in their farm, they call people, and they mail them. Most people fall down by not getting to their people, their sphere, their farm. They don't get them engaging content. Our new sponsor, Discover Publications, takes that one step further. For just slightly more than the cost of a stamp, Discover Publications creates a completely customized newspaper. Now they'll go out and they'll curate content or you can create your own. Prior to having them on the show, I called some of Discover Publications clients and I talked to this one guy and he does some interesting things. He'll go out and interview restaurants that are in his farm, in his sphere. He creates a write-up. He, interestingly enough, resells advertising in his own newspaper to his trusted network, whether that's the plumber or the insurance agent. And by the way, this guy has 60% market penetration. He told me the paper has cemented those numbers. If you're interested, go check out discoverpubs.com. Let me know what you think. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Hey guys, I'm pretty excited about today's guest. We are finally completing the Ferry family circle. Yeah, I'm talking about Mike Ferry, Tom Ferry, and today we have something special. All of those guys are trainers in the world of real estate. All those guys have a message and all of them are making a difference. I'm thrilled to have the last piece in the puzzle, Matthew Ferry. Hey Matthew, thanks for taking the time out today. Oh, super stoked to be on the on the call with you today. Can't wait to uh, to inspire and empower people. All right. Hey, listen. So, so for everybody that doesn't know your story, maybe take a minute, tell us a little bit about yourself, and I, and then tell us what you have, what you have going on right now. I, well, I almost I almost told them what you're doing, but but run it, take it away. <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, listen. I uh, at a very early age, I had a recording contract that failed. And um, in my in my misery and my and my letdown, my wonderful father said, "Why don't you come and and work with me?" And I said, oh, "I don't even know. I don't even understand what you do." And he said, "Well, come and sell." And I said, uh, "What does selling even mean?" And he said, "Well, you just got to read this script to people on the phone and see if they want to come." I was like, "Okay, I was a musician. I can probably read a script if I can read music. I do. I can do that." And for some reason. It really, this industry just really hit me. You know, my father uh, began to expose me to Napoleon Hill, Earl Nightingale, eventually um, people like Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra. I got exposed to um, neurolinguistic programming, and I, I, I really gravitated towards the idea of something called conversational hypnosis. And um, it stuck, and all of a sudden, my ability to sell went through the the roof. In fact, within three years, I became the number one salesperson of my father's company. And this crazy thing happened, Toby. All of a sudden, I was on the phone with a, a broker one day, and I was just going through what he could do to impact his agents and get them to uh, sell more. And all of a sudden, he said, well, Matthew, can you come out and and do to me what or do to my agents what you just did to me? Because that, that was amazing. And all I did was get on the phone with him and um, sell him a $2,000 video training, but he actually related to the sale of it 
like I was doing something so positive for him. And this was like a big shift in my mindset. And that was the beginning. And over the years, I struggled with this idea that, you know, Toby, I'd teach people what to do. I'd teach them how to sell. And they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't do it. You're paying me thousands and thousands of dollars. And you're not doing the things that we know for a fact will work. And it wasn't until 1999 that I had an aha moment. I was coaching some of the top agents in the world at that time, a man named Chris Heller doing about 160 deals a year, another guy named John Ferber who was doing uh, about uh, 102, 105 deals a year, Karen Bernardi doing about 160, 70 deals. This was a long time ago. I'm trying to remember their numbers. But these people – had something totally different going on and it really impacted me and i i was always obsessed with mindset and understanding the mechanics of my brain but i never really i never really put it together the way that i did in 1999 where i saw these agents they didn't work on getting more skills in place what they did was they got skilled but then they worked on their mindset and then their mindset unlocked their skill set. Hmm. And that was that was a moment for me right there. That changed everything. Yeah, that's amazing. So look, there's a lot in that. I, and I want to get to that for in a second. So so let's go back. So your dad came on and said, hey, you know, uh, and by the way, you said recording contract. I don't know that everybody exactly is going to put that together. You were what? You were a singer. Um, yeah, I have. A, a, I'm a singer, songwriter, producer. Okay. Um, I had a band back then. Um, I still put out music now. I actually use the techniques um, that I teach to um, to fuel all of my hobbies, and um, you know I've made uh, over a half a million dollars doing music part time hmm. by implementing the techniques that I teach people. Okay, that's interesting. So, so you know, so your dad Mike said, "Hey, come and work with me," and and uh, you said, "Well, geez, you know what I have to do? I, you, you read this script." You said, "Well, I can probably read the script," <laughs> and, and that's your dad's bit. I mean, I went to uh, I, I recently uh, well maybe a year ago, he was in San Diego, it was after I had him on the show, and I went, and I just showed up, and I, I wasn't going to pay, because I just, but I wanted to see him in action, and see what he does, and, and I went on Friday the last day, and basically, your dad is very much, a, a, what he teaches is relatively simple, right, there's no magic there, it's like, hey, you know, make the call, and close, right, ask for the business, um, is, is that, somebody told me your message is a slightly different, that you're relatively unique, can you kind of wrap up your coaching style, uh, in, in, I don't know, in 15 seconds. Yes. Um, what you do is a function of how you see the world. Hmm. So if you change the way you see the world, you will function differently. And therefore, if you understand how to develop a point of view that makes you more productive, you can fundamentally change your business by changing your mindset. What you do is a function of how you see the world. Give me an example. I mean, that's a that's no a, problem. Okay, here's a great example. So, um, you know, listen, I was the top coach for the Mike Ferry organization for many, many years, and I had developed a reputation as the turnaround coach. Hmm. So, uh, what I what I realized was, um, I can teach people what to do; they don't do it. And I can show people the skills to become great salespeople. I develop those skills in myself. I develop the ability to teach those skills and um, quote unquote install them in somebody's behavior. But they weren't doing it. And so, so let's say one of the other coaches, you know, there was there's at, at the Mike Ferry organization as many as 70 coaches at any given time. And one of the coaches would send me a person to say, Matthew, I can't, I can't figure it out. I've tried and tried and tried to get this person to um, implement what it's going to take for them to be successful, and there's just there's something blocking them. And I would get these clients over and over and over and over and over. And ultimately, let's say, let's say for example, the person wants to um, develop their past clients and sphere of influence database and increase the amount of deals that they're getting from a referral basis. Okay. But, but something's blocking them. Um, what happens is what 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 I do is I go in and I look at well what is the mindset malfunction that's occurring here, and I I have actually created a whole system around figuring out 
well, how, what is the mindset malfunction and then what's the workaround? So for example, with a person calling their past clients and their sphere of influence, they're likely having a mindset malfunction called forecasting the negative. It's, yeah. it's something that I call an unconscious reflex. Just like if you um, hit the knee with a hammer, it, you know, it jerks, there's a reflex. Yep. The mind has reflexes like that. Interesting. And so um, what I do is I go in, I help them to rewire the reflex, understand it differently, see it differently. I use something called recontextualization. And then we create an entirely new way of viewing the, the, the scenario. So before they might be thinking, Toby, I want to I wanna call them. But I don't want to be embarrassed. And you know, what if they think that all I want is a commission out of them? You know, I don't want to ruin my reputation in the community. They have this this future that they've created that is actually debilitating them. It's not yeah. real. It's not true. And there's nothing that says that it is. But we don't live from truth. We live from mindset. And so if you can't control the mindset, you can't control the behavior. So I would just help people to see it in a new way. And suddenly, let's say, for example, I teach them a process called giving the gift. And giving the gift is something that I developed for literally just people like myself. I, as, as um, sort of outwardly expressed as I sound, um, I have like a little bit of a shyness that goes on with me. And when I get into social situations, I feel a little awkward or uncomfortable and I developed a system so that I could get out of that. And I call it giving the gift. Okay. And all it is, is I just seek to connect deeply with people and find out what they're all about. Take all the attention off of me, put all the attention on them, ask them a ton of questions. Mm -hmm. In doing so, I'm able to breathe a sigh of relief because nobody's going to find out about me or talk to me or blah, 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 because I'm putting all the attention on them. Yeah. Then once I find out what they're all about and what they're up to, I am actively seeking to make a difference. How can I support or help or contribute? And this is something that I developed about you know, 10 years ago as a tool to overcome this. And it's something that with, for example, your past clients and sphere of influence, if you just seek to make a difference and find out all about them and be, be an investigator, be a scientist and see if you can understand what's really going on in their life and make a difference. It's mind blowing the amount of deals that you get. I have a client right now who is having his best listing month ever in his entire career. The most he's ever done before is seven listings in a month. He's already taken eight. And as of the time of this recording, it's the 25th. And he's on track. He says, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to do nine or 10 listings for the month. And I said, well, Dave, what are you doing differently? And he said, Matthew, quite honestly, all I'm doing is trying to connect and make a difference for people. I'm just giving the gift. Interesting. So, that, so that's changing. You change the way you see it. Your, your behavior is a function of how you see the world. Got it. Okay. That makes a lot more sense to me. But so let me ask you, it was when you first started that you, you said, I wrote it down because you said, you know, these people would come, right? They have all the tools, right? Because you're, you're teaching them the skills, you're teaching them the mechanics, but they just don't do, they don't do what they know what works, even though they're paying you, you know, a lot of money. And then you said, you know, something is blocking them. And, and it, made, it made me, this is the question I have, and I don't exactly know how to frame it, but you know, this is something we see in ourselves. We see it all around us. People know what they should do, but they just don't take action. Is it, you know, and do you feel, Matthew, that, that whenever we're not implementing something or taking action, do you think there's some unconscious thing that is blocking us doing that? Whatever it is, we know that we feel better when we go to the gym. We want to go to the gym, but we don't do it, even though we're paying, you know, 50 bucks a month for, for a mem gym membership. Is, is, is all of these things that we don't do, is it, is, is, do they all correlate with, with some sort of block in the past? Absolutely. And it's not even a block. In, it's not even a block in the past. Uh, I'll give you another example. Um, you know, let's say, for example, you are wanting to follow up on leads and you've got this um, stack of leads that you have developed. Maybe you you are you've got a pretty good, um, uh, you know, PPC campaign that you're running. And you got a you got, got a nice steady stream of people coming in every single month, mm -hmm. but something blocks you from from calling them. And a lot of times, what what I notice is 
um, I, I call this mindset malfunction, um, holding yourself accountable to rules that don't exist. So you have this rule, um, don't bug people. Yeah. Don't impose on them. Right. And that's a fantastic rule if you're a five-year-old and you are out door knocking on all of your friends' houses and inviting yourself over for dinner. Your, right. mo- your mom did you a favor by in, you know, installing that rule. The problem is that the drunk monkey really – the drunk monkey is my little nickname for the voice in, in our head. The, the drunk monkey in our head literally does not evolve past about five years old. Right. So we are stuck with these routines that, if not examined, run the show. And, um, you know, the, the, the absolute travesty for agents is that they are operating from a set of rules and codes of conduct that don't exist in reality – Yet they're limiting the way that they operate, and I think it's more insidious than that, right? So, so, so that that's certainly on one level. But so, so your word is the drunk monkey. But what about? Let me, you know, this is what you made me think of. What about? Um, you know, there there is sort of a notion. Uh, uh, a lot of people say I want to get rich, but you know what? How many of us in the in the in the world out there had parents or grandparents or something that said, "Man, you know, what? rich people they're only rich because." They did something bad. To, you know, they're not good people, right? Yep. If you heard this when you're a kid, right? You, you, that that monkey doesn't evolve after five years old. Even if you have the skills and all that stuff to get rich, to be wealthy, um, maybe you will get you know get to a certain point and then self sabotage yourself, your own success. No doubt. How you, often have you seen that? Uh, over and over and over. People, uh, when I meet people, Toby, it's like this. Uh, we we start talking. And they, they're complaining, Matthew, gosh, my, my foot constantly has a hole in it, and it's bleeding nonstop, and I can't figure out what it is. And then we'll hear this, bang, and I'll say, whoa, what was that? And they're like, I don't know, but there's the hole again. <laughs> and then I say, but wait a second, there's a, that was a gun. You're shooting yourself in the foot. I'm not shooting myself in the foot. It's not me. I'm not doing anything. I'm saying, that's a gun right there in your hand. Right. It is, right? It is. It's through the awareness that you're the one shooting yourself in the foot that gives you a, a different option. So I have um, what I've developed um, as a mindset methodology. It's a toolbox that I use to assist people in unsticking whatever is causing them to be stuck. And one of the main tools that I use is called the Game Changer Process. And the Game Changer basically says that awareness – makes you flexible, which reveals new options and gives you power. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to become aware of what's actually going on because most of what's going on, Toby, is unconscious, exactly what you said. When I was a kid, my parents told me over and over, yes, I know the people you know, four blocks over are all rich and they have, you know, they've got the motorcycles and the RVs that they take out on the weekends and they go out on their boat and blah, blah, blah. But they only have that because they're bad people and they've done something to screw other people over. Right, right. This is like programmed in. Now, you don't even know. You're just cruising along and you're like, oh, my God, I want what they want. I want what they got. Yeah. But you can't seem to get to it because the mind that created the problem can't solve it. You actually have to bring in a completely different point of view. And that's the key, right? It really comes down to this. What you're present to, the future that you see, determines the behavior that you have. So unless someone helps you to shift the way you see things, you will be biologically hardwired to keep getting the results that you're getting. Check it out. Here's a a quote from one of my favorite Harvard researchers, Sean Aker. He did a, a whole study on um, what happens when someone gets into an optimistic state. And he, he studied all kinds of people at Harvard. And a, a few that he cited, which I thought were interesting, is he said, I would prime a doctor. So prime is a um, scientific term for um, invoke, invoke a feeling. So I would prime a doctor into a happy, optimistic state. 
and then have that doctor do a diagnosis. And then I would have another group that I would prime into a negative state and another group that I would not do anything to. And the doctors who were primed into a positive state had 25% more accuracy in their diagnosis. Kids who were primed into a positive optimistic state had 50% more accuracy in solving puzzles than kids who were neutral or negative. But here was the kicker. Salespeople had 37% more closed sales when they were primed into an optimistic state. Now, all of that's wonderful, right? So, hey, hey let's go and get happy and positive. Well, I don't know about what you've experienced, but good luck on that. And – Harvard has something to say about it. Another Harvard uh, research project was done where they used iPhones to have people. They created an iPhone app, and they had people just report in what was going on with their mindset. And it was shocking to them after a year's worth of research and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of reports. What they discovered was something that they didn't think they were going to discover, which is that an idle mind – defaults to the negative. Hmm. Now, that wasn't a surprise to me because I've been working with thousands of people for 20 plus years, but it's it, the, the premise is very simple. The mind, all by itself, undisciplined, not made to be your servant, but instead you let it be your master and do whatever it wants, that mind will default to the negative every time. Fact, that is interesting, and I want to I want to talk about that. But you, I should have I should have timed you, man. I mean that. So that's a, that monologue. You, you there's so much stuff in there. So I want to I want to go back really quickly. So w one thing you said, <clears throat> you said you have to first become aware, right? Become aware of what what those things that are sticking you or or whatever. Become aware, and then you need someone to help uh, to help change that. Now, you have used language like you're hardwired into that. So, so my question to you is, you know, w once you sort of become aware, and and maybe you can do it on your own, maybe you can't, but once you become aware, you need to not only uh, prime yourself into a positive state, right? Um, but somehow you need to reprogram yourself, right? You need to, you know, if you're if you're hardwired, the 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 red wires on the black post, right? You need to get those wires straightened out. How do you, or is it possible to take a person? You know, look, I'm 44. How old are you? I am 47. Oh my gosh. I didn't think you. I thought you were. I thought you were younger than me, man. I didn't no, know that. Okay, so I'm the, I'm the I'm the oldest of the fairy boys. That's amazing. I did not. You look younger than Tom. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so so so, but again, right? So I have 44 years on this earth. I am hardwired a certain way, and I and I know I'm I'm conscious of of you know my limitations or my limiting beliefs. And I try to work those out all the time. But how do I not you know? Is it possible to reprogram myself, get that wiring and straighten it out? And not me, everybody in the audience listening. Well, listen, I've been to Tony Robbins and I've tried it and it works for a while. Yeah. Um, I've been to um, uh, Landmark Education and it's pretty awesome and it works for a while. And I have done affirmations and those are pretty handy and it works for a while. Yep. Um, but nothing, not a single, not a single thing that I've ever tried is more effective than recontextualization. And recontextualization is a, is a tool in my mindset methodology. It's something that I learned from one of my mentors named Dr. David Hawkins. And it really can be most easily understood in this way, that before we knew the earth was round, we feared going too far out into the ocean because we didn't know where the edge of the earth was, but we weren't willing to risk it to find out. So our behavior, our hard wiring – was created by the context, the inaccurate context, that the world is flat. The moment that the prevailing thoughts began that the world is round, our hard wiring changed. We didn't do anything. No affirmations, no visualization necessary. Right. Didn't know, need to go to Tony Robbins and do some, you know, walking on hot coals. Didn't need to do any of that. All, all that happened was a new reality was presented, and the reality was such that all of the programming changed. So the most powerful thing to do to change your hardwiring is to actually change your mindset, your mindset being basically your point of view. 
Okay, so so what you said to me there, like I, I would correlate that or, or I would um, – I don't know, contextualize the word. I would, th- I would think about the word this way. So, you know, so with the whole, the the guys who thought they would fall off the edge of the earth, right? Because when they, they thought the world was flat and then when they realized it was round, right? So that you gave them a new context. Now, I think about like nobody thought that uh, people could run a six minute mile. As soon as the guy ran this or four minute mile, whatever it is, I'm not a runner. Four That's, minute. Four, four minute, minute mile. mile yeah. Okay. You know, four minutes, and all of a sudden, everybody could do it. You know, it's just like in, I grew up uh, in, in high school. I used to skateboard, right? So uh, the, the, Mc, uh, the, the McTwist, right? That's 540. Nobody thought, you know, it was like amazing trick. As soon as uh, um, uh, it, it was done, like everybody could do it, right? And then it turned into 540 and 720, and, and Tony Hawk's now pulled off a nine, whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so it's all about realizing a new reality realizing that that we can go farther so again for me and you and everybody how do we how do we give our own selves a new context new frame of reference to view the world and then to view to to review uh, or reposition our view of ourself well the absolutely the first thing to do is the game changer process so step one you have to become aware of the inaccuracies in your own point of view and that that takes some um, tools and it takes some investigation the second thing that happens automatically so the moment you become aware of that's me shooting myself in the foot you instantly become flexible no longer are you just arbitrarily pulling the trigger on a regular basis blowing a hole in your foot suddenly you're like wait a second maybe that's not the right thing to do now as soon as you get flexible options reveal themselves Mm. so Mm. options naturally appear there's no you don't have to do anything you just instantaneously become aware of new options and here's the kicker optionality is the basis for power so the power to make the change actually comes from the new options that are naturally revealed. It begins with awareness. If you don't know that you have a default forecasting the negative mindset malfunction happening, then you can't do anything about it. If you don't realize that you have a desire to fit in and that the desire to fit in actually comes from the genetic programming that ensured you fit in with your tribe so you didn't die, which has nothing to do with today. If you didn't know you have that, you're in trouble. If you didn't realize that you are holding people accountable to agreements they never made, then you'll you'll think that there are jerks in the world. And Toby, there are no jerks in the world until you show up. <laughs> okay, uh, Matthew, you're, you're this is really really meaty. Okay, so let's go back for a second. So you need to be flex- become aware of the inaccuracy of your viewpoint, uh, become flexible. And all of a sudden, when you become flexible, um, options reveal themselves. Now, uh, when those and, – and, and now take off again from that because, listen, people, here's what people are doing while they're listening to this show. They're driving to work. They're mowing their lawn, right? They're, they're doing something else. And so and, – and there are some people. I guarantee you, man, there are some people right now sitting at their desk. I get I – get, I, we have a very strong tribe on Twitter, and I people will send me – pictures and I will sometimes I'll get I'll get pictures and people will take picture the notes they took from an episode and it's crazy I've seen people take like four pages of notes so people are going to be taking notes so I want you to go back options reveal themselves and it's those options that give us power give us power so the the person with the most options has the most power it's much easier to understand if you look at the the um, corollary when you feel powerless what you're actually expressing is a future that does not have options. So when you feel powerless, the future that you're present to is a future that has minimal options, and most of the options are ones that you don't want. That's what feeling powerless is. Again, the future that you are present to, the what you see in the world, your expectation determines how you behave in this moment. So if I don't see a lot of options, I will then behave from a survival standpoint. And the problem is, let's I'm let's just go to let's go to calling leads, okay? okay. I'm I'm calling leads. I'm not aware of that I only think there's a few options. 
One option, they hate me. The other option, they'll hang up on me. The third option, they're going to scream at me. The fourth option, they're already working with another agent. The fifth option, they don't want to be bothered. If I see those five options and I need to feed my family yeah, and I'm paying a thousand bucks a month for my PPC campaign to bring in these leads, I, I am compelled to call them out of fear of not surviving. Yeah. So now I'm calling them. But who am I as I call them? I am a fearful, greedy, self-centered person who believes in advance that I'm going to meet with opposition. Now, the problem with that is the behavior itself is a self-fulfilling prophecy yep. and causes the results. And then you know what the drunk monkey in my head says? I told you. <laughs> you knew it before you started. But so, so, but yeah, I mean, that was, listen, you, you got to, I was going to ask that same question. So we know that, you know, if we look at everybody around us, like, you know, so I've been successful, you've been successful. We don't operate out of those, that place of desperateness or that place of, you know, I, you know, I'm not worried about paying my rent next month. Right. But a lot of people are, are out there They're They do live paycheck to paycheck. Right. So, so how do you, how do you clear yourself? Right. And say, OK, I'm not I'm going to be present. I mean, you've said being present a few times. How do you clear? So I'm just going, I'm going to be present and I'm going to I'm going to clean the slate. I'm going to prime myself for being positive while I make these calls for my my pay per click campaign. Let's get him back. Matthew. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. No, that's all right. Okay, so how do I – can we – do we keep the recording going? Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, great. So how, how do I prime myself to be in that more optimal state Yeah. when I've got these leads to call and yet um, the, the meaning of these leads are very, very valuable, right? The, the possibility of me not being able to pay my rent is very high. So I've got to turn something out of this. I gotta, I gotta try and make this into something. How do I stay out of a survival mindset and get into a thriving mindset? Right. And the answer is actually through contribution. So one of the things that I have noted over the years is that there are high conscious ways of operating and low conscious ways of operating. And this comes from my mentor, Dr. David Hawkins, and my correlating of his um, research into my work. And high conscious ways of operating are ways of operating that are constructive and uplifting. And you can only access them when you are using your prefrontal cortex, the front of your brain. So if you don't get into a, a – um, uh, optimal state, you're going to likely default – to the back of your brain, which is where the drunk monkey lives. It's the fight or flight mechanism, the limbic system in the brain. So by aligning with, for example, a high conscious state contribution, rather than aligning with a low conscious state greed, I actually cause my biology to function differently. And the emphasis of my of my brain power moves from the back to the front when that happens what do i have resourcefulness creativity logic reason intuition five of the most powerful things i could possibly bring to a sales conversation if i stay in the back what do i have i've got things like fear anxiety frustration fight Terrible things to bring to a sales call. So what I practice is two things. I practice first completely releasing my attachment. So attachment is an exaggerated fear of losing some positive benefit. Yeah. And I go through a process. There's actually a multi-step process for releasing attachment. I go through that process. I come to a place of neutral. From neutral, I now can do something. So from neutral, I say, I am going to forget about my own needs, forget about my need to pay my rent, forget about my need to turn something from these leads, forget about the fact that I spent another $1,000 on these leads this month, and I didn't call the ones last month. <laughs> I'm going to forget about all that because the person on the other side doesn't care at all. Right. What they care about is 
I need to sell my house. I need to buy a house. How much can I get for it? What can I pay for it? Can I pay less? Can I? Can you get me more? They have other concerns, and even those concerns are literally surface concerns. Their real concerns are, I want to feel safe. I want to have a happy family. I want my children to prosper. I want to demonstrate to my community that I'm successful, which are deeper and more powerful concerns. But I can't even get to those if I allow myself to unconsciously be in a state of greed. Got it. Let me break in here with a message from our sponsor. Our sponsor, Discover Publications, will create a customized, branded, 12-page newspaper that will be sent out to your farm and sphere. Now, this paper is cheaper than you think. For slightly more than the cost of a stamp, you can start sending out curated content and always stay top of mind. Never lose a deal again because that prospect just happened to forget that you were in real estate or misplaced your number. Go check them out at discoverpubs.com. It would be interesting if if we could all live in the world of, at least in my mind, right, live in the world of possibility. I and mean, here's what I mean by that. Um, you know, internet marketers, I'm sure you know, but, you know, it, they know the lifetime value of a client. And, I, and I've talked about this on my show, right? If you can know the lifetime value of your clients, um, you know, look, and here's a great example. I had one lady on my show. Uh, she sells upper end home, like, you know, like three to five million dollar houses. Um, and uh, she tracks everything, which everybody should do. But she she sold a house of, of somebody's, and she she is very very good at working her past clients. That one person, that one person, um, uh, gave was responsible for nineteen other deals, nineteen other sides in her business, and she did the math on that. And overall, in commission, that one person accounted for seven million dollars worth of commissions in her pocket. I wonder if it would be helpful to be able to live in in a constant state of possibility, knowing that that next person that you call could be responsible for 19 other deals or that next door that you're going to knock on. You know what I mean? Like that next thing, it, the possibility is gigantic. But what you're talking about, Toby, is um, having dealt with your own mortality, you're talking right. about moving from um, a, a state of of self-centeredness and self-serving to a state of making a difference and contributing. And unfortunately, I mean, uh, when we see these top producers and, and and brother, I have coached you know maybe 500 top producers personally, people who are making 700,000 to, you know, two or 3 million to, you know, the most I've ever worked with is a guy who made over $20 million selling real estate one house at a time. In one so, year? In one year. But <laughs> the, the, the distinction, what's, here's the thing is that I would then go and take what those people talk about and do, and I would teach them to everybody else. But what I found was the difference between these two groups was so massive that I could talk to us blue in the face to the to the the normal realtor out there is not going to be able to get themselves to mentally be where that top producer is. Something happened with that top producer. They lucked out some kind of something happened, right? So they have some like an environmental thing that occurred. Typically, they had something that was so disastrous and terrible in their life that it woke them up. That's pretty typical. But other people are just kind of born with this um, very intense amount of self-awareness. Um, and, you know, the rest of us, we kind of suffer along wondering, you know, what do they have that, that I don't have? And what I'm dedicated to is helping people with the tools of awareness that will free them from the unconscious reflexes of their mind, these mindset malfunctions that are robbing them of thousands of dollars of commissions that they don't even know about, right? I mean, think about it like this. Here's a, a very simple one. We have a desire to fit in. This desire to fit in stops us dead in our tracks, but we don't know it because Early on in our life, we were naturally compelled to be like the people around us. And if we aren't like the people around us, it makes them feel uncomfortable. It's easy to see that in a teenager. A teenager wants to be more independent. So what do they do? They go and they join another group. And they come home. They're walking different, talking different, moving different. They have different interests. And it creates an uh, upheaval in the family. The family's threatened by the teenager behaving in this different fashion. Well, this is 
very normal, typical tribal mentality. It's programmed into our genetics. So now you go out and you're a real estate agent and you want to sell a bunch of houses. The problem is you're trying to follow your family rules with a group of people who don't know what your family rules are. They behave totally differently. It offends you on a regular basis. You get shut down by the way that people operate or you don't say what you need to say because in your family you don't do that and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And if you don't, if you don't become aware of this functioning in the background, forget about it. You'll be stuck at a low level of deals for the rest of your career and there's nothing you can do about it. You go to a thousand Tony Robbins seminars and get all pumped up. You go to my dad's seminars. He'll teach you exactly what to do to sell houses. To the T, you follow what he says, you will make millions selling houses, yet most people can't get themselves to take those actions. Yeah, they cannot get out of their own way, man. Yep. So, so let me. So, look I, I, again. I mean, you there's a, you are delivering stuff here. So, and I want to tell you. So, we're at 37 minutes. I'm just I, I'm saying it a little bit early because I because you're a little bit long winded, which is great. I'm not saying anything bad about that. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna start wrapping up here a little bit. So, no problem. Here's what I want to know, um, uh, if you can, Matthew. Um, when we're deal right, the front of the brain. How do we get into that that uh, that position of of re really contributing to our neighbors you know contributing to our, our our neighborhood our community at large because right that is operating at that front part of your brain and if we can if we can train ourselves to believe that uh, every door every call that we're making you know we have the cure to cancer we have the you know if we can believe that that our message and what we're doing is that important you know maybe maybe some of this other stuff goes away i, I don't know what's your take on that it's 100% right, and the, the way to do that is to release attachment, which means to understand the exaggerations of the mindset malfunction. So the mindset malfunctions, it exaggerates some benefit that you're going to lose if you take a certain kind of action, and if you don't unravel that, then you'll never actually get to a place where you feel like you're contributing. And, and I mean, Toby, let's be honest. You and I have both met many, many very illuminated, enlightened, malfunctioning people. <laughs> yes. I am making a difference in contributing to the planet. And they make $20,000 a year and no one cares. Right. Yeah. So you can be – you can say all the right words, and there's plenty of people who um, I call them spiritual derelicts. They say all the right words. I'm just about love and peace and contribution and making a difference and blah, 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 and yet their life is a, is a shambles. Yeah. What I'm talking about is taking yourself on, and when you take yourself on, the natural result is you want to help others. Got it. The na okay, all right. So it's a natural evolution. What about this? Let's. So, so we've been talking a lot about how to you know become aware of ourselves, um, so that that uh, we that uh, you know we can be flexible. Options reveal themselves, and we can gain power that way. How can we use? Early on, you said that you kind of what you did was conversational hypnosis. And uh, can we use this for evil? And, and that's a bad word, but you know what I'm saying. Like, how can we use it against people? Because what you're what, here's the what answer you, is the answer is yes. Yeah. So let's talk about that because here's what you said, and and I don't mean it evil, but so you said you know you can go talk with people and you know about selling their house, and they will have their surface concerns, but then they will have their real concerns, and and sometimes they're not in touch with what their real concerns are. How, how do you how do you dig that out of somebody? You have to use a, a procedure called criteria, and so criteria is a, is a um, multi-step process, but you begin with the question, what's important about moving? And then you move to the next level of criteria. So that, that will give you their surface answer. You say, what's important about moving? person says, I want a bigger house. Well, it doesn't really have a lot of meaning or juice or whatever. So then you have to you have to have the emotional intelligence yourself, meaning you need to you have to be able to um, get close to people and have intimacy with people without feeling weird about it mm -hmm. to ask the next couple of questions. 
So I just want to point that out that there's actually a mindset that will stop you from doing this. But let's just role play together, can we? Sure, absolutely. So you be the you be the customer okay. and I'll be the real estate agent. So let's just pretend we're at the listing presentation and you know, we've been talking for a little bit and I just say, Toby, I, I just want to understand better. Can you just tell me what's important to you about selling this house? Um you know what? What's important to me, the, 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 I actually, I actually have an acre and a half. I'm in San Diego. So I have a big yard. Um, the, the yard is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. Mm. So you have a lot more work than you thought that, that you were signing up for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, it's so big that I can't, I, you know, to hire it out. Um, you know, I, I honestly can't, I can't spend, you know, I, I can't see myself spending 1500 bucks a month and it's, and I have done it before. And, and, and Matthew, it still is not where I want it. Right. So you you got to spend fifteen hundred bucks a month to only have it be adequate, yeah. not even not even to a place where you are proud when you when you're walking around the grounds. Exactly right. Exactly uh, right. It's it's it. Yeah, it's 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 barely clean that way. I want it. I want it. I want a yard that is absolutely pristine, like like, you, you know, just like yeah. the garage that you really want. Yeah, like, um, you know, at a castle. Right. right. You want to go out on the grounds and just have it be beautiful and manicured. Absolutely. So. Um, how is this important to you, being able to um, let go of this problem of having to constantly deal with your acre, acre and a half? I mean, what's that going to do for you? What it's going to do for me is I, it's, it's going to make my, I, I, you know, I listen, Matthew, I do a bunch of stuff. I race cars, uh, you know, I snowboard, and I think that if I can get rid of this problem, um, I can uh, I can spend more time doing the stuff that I'm passionate about because I am not passionate about you know trimming bushes and raking leaves. But here's the here's the problem, Matthew. Here's another problem that I'm. It's my wife and kids love it. They love this. It's, it was a big house and they love all the grounds because they bring their friends over and you know it's to them it's all you know because nobody's got an acre and a half like this. Yeah, it's heaven, right? Yeah, it's, right. It's, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's like yeah. a park. People come over yeah. like it's a park. So, ultimately. We have appeased the children. We found this ultimate place for the kids um, that they love even more than they love this. Your wife is over the moon about the new place that you're moving to. You have eradicated this $1,500 of, of disaster that needs to occur every single month to only be um, dissatisfied. And you find yourself snowboarding and racing and focusing on the things that bring you more joy. I mean, Toby, ultimately, what will all of this do for you? I'm, 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 I'm going to be happier. Isn't that a great feeling, though? <laughs> it, it, it is. Now, notice the little chuckle, right? The chuckle was because there was an actual emotion that was coming up and you were having an experience in this moment, even though we were just role playing. But you know what? Here, here's here's why. Yeah, right. But here's why I was chuckling because I knew what you're, and this has been done to me before. Right. I knew what you're doing. So first of all, you said you're dissatisfied. So you're making me put give a, a kind of a negative, a, 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 put me in a negative state to to my current situation. And then you built up on, you know, wouldn't it be great when you can snowboard and, and get into your passion stuff, right? And, and then you That's and right. then you, and you you uh, anchored it with that last thing. And I'm like, you know, and I knew what you're doing but but yeah i'm like oh that makes it doesn't sense. matter <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter here's the thing though okay um you know that's a sales skill and um, maybe there'll be a time in the future where i teach people these sales skills again and um i consider myself an an, ex, uh, an expert in nlp based selling techniques um but what i found was uh, i could teach people that technique but what stops them is their unwillingness to be intimate with someone they're on their the rule that they're that they're holding the other person to or the standard that they have about, um, you know, what's too much to ask or what's um, how far can you actually go? These things stop you from being an effective salesperson. So um, there are plenty of people that will teach you amazing sales techniques. I learned from all those people, too. But what we've got to do is unlock your ability to actually use them. Right. Right. And you know, you know, I think Matthew too, I, um, and I'd love to get your take on this. So, so how, you know, in terms of asking questions, right. And probing or whatever, how far can you go 
And I think here's the deal. Somebody told me on this show, somebody said, you know what? People like whatever way you live, let's say you live in a $300,000 house or a $500,000 house or, or, you know, I'm in San Diego. So maybe other places, it's a $150,000 house. Um, you are not going to feel comfortable selling a million dollar house in that market. You know, and I think for those people, all of a sudden, man, it, it, you're going to feel out of water, right? Or out of, not out of your depth because you're talking to somebody who you deem as rich and you think they are different. And, and then, um, and I, now I'm talking more than I should as a host, but and so then right. what would happen, right? You know, the, that whole total presence thing, right? You, you know, uh, talk, talk, talk about that briefly and, and talk about how it, go. I'm just, I'll stop. Key, absolute key to this entire thing is to dispel the myths that you are living inside of. So there's a whole series of myths that you've got to do. I have a whole set of procedures that I teach on investigating the myths that you're living underneath, the rules that don't exist. Once you identify that you're living by all of these rules that don't exist, you can then do a, a releasing of attachment exercise as well as an exercise that I call the worst case scenario. Hmm. Yeah. And when you do that, when you have identified your own BS, you have released the exaggeration that your BS actually is, and then you have, have dealt with the worst possible thing that could happen and made peace with it, all of a sudden, Toby, it's, it's, it's like a volcano of inspiration comes out of your body. You, you can't wait to go do the activity, the thing that just 10 minutes before you were saying to yourself, I can't call these people. I mean, this is one of my specialties is getting you to do the stuff that you have been afraid to do because of some weird glass ceiling that, is, that you put on yourself. Amazing, man. Uh, well, listen, next time you do a, a seminar, man, I, I, you know, look, I'm in San Diego. Do, whatever you do, so you're in Newport. You're, you know, an hour from me. I should go show up and, and hang out and check it out. <laughs> listen, so I'm going to ask you a couple questions in the end, and I'm, gonna, I'm asking him again a little bit earlier than I normally do because I know the, the, how you answer stuff. So here I'm going to ask you something I, I, I rarely, rarely ask, but when I have a guest like you, I feel like I need to ask this. And here it is, kind of a crazy question. What's one thing, Matthew, I didn't ask you? but I should have. Probably um, what is the most optimal state of mind to be in? What is that? Neutrality. Mm. And neutrality simply means that you are humble, but you're curious. You don't know if anything's going to happen. You don't, you expect everything to happen. You have no um, commitment either way. You're a scientist. And as a scientist, you're curious, you're humble, you want to know, but you don't pretend to know. You're willing to find out. Right. You know, and, and, and that kind of that really ties into a lot of the stuff that you've said in, in this uh, in this episode is right. Like you talk about attachment and right. And I talk a lot about don't be attached to the outcome. If you can be at that listing presentation or or whatever it is, don't be attached to the outcome, because if you are attached, for the most part, you're probably, you know, you're probably more on the desperate side than than not. And uh, and people can smell that stuff a mile away. Well, you know, my mentors have been saying that to me for for decades and um, I, I swear, I used to beat my head up against the wall because I'd be like, okay, great. Oh, sure. I won't be attached to the outcome, right? How the heck do I get there, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's the procedure? And so it, it was really through my own suffering and my, my need to figure out the procedure that I figured out that there's actually a several-step process that you have to go through, that if you'll go through that process, you'll become unattached. And the moment you become unattached, you're naturally inspired. Amazing, man. I, w I would love to spend an hour in your house looking through your, at your bookcase. I, I, I bet it would be a really interesting uh, set of books there. I'm sure that it would be, except I have a policy to never hold on to anything. And everything that I, that I get that I'm no longer using, I give away. Really? Everything. What, uh, I mean, um, I met someone else like this as well. I mean, they get, they get something, a book, what, read it, and they get rid of it. Uh, what's the thinking behind that? And, and is that something that, that I, can, I can potentially implement and, and benefit? Well, what I've learned over the years is that what you have holds you down and defines you. 
And if you are committed to um, continuously becoming and going to the next level and, and taking yourself on, then you've got to continuously give things away and um, get rid of the attachments and the things that are, are holding you back. And so uh, it's also – so that's one side. Then the other side is really um, being someone who is um, – engaging the flow, the the ebb and flow that is out there in the world. And if you are in a perpetual state of giving, um, you end up being in a perpetual state of receiving. And one of the things that, that my students are all blown away by when they begin to study this process is just how much stuff they start getting for free. Mm, interesting. That's really – look, let me ask you this. So I'm I'm a little bit the opposite, and I'm not – you know, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, and today I have success, but I, I didn't grow up like that. And so if I have something, um, I'm a little bit of the mindset, and I'm, I'm a I, – I, whatever. So I'll get something, and, I, and I, don't, I don't need it. I'm done with it, right? I don't need it today, but I will, I will throw it in my shed because I'm like, I might need that, you know, in the future. <laughs> So, so that's one yep. thing, and here's the other, but here's the other thing, and I want you to talk a little, to a little bit. Uh, no wonder you got 1.5 acres. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's not like you are. I have one shed, but um, so, but the other thing is this. So let's say I'll get. Here's a great example. I'm sitting in in the studio right now. I just got a brand new chair for for my desk. Now my other chair is it's, it's a nice chair. It's a leather chair, or whatever. I don't need it. And I, I told my wife is like she's like oh you got a new chair. She's like I'll throw the other one away. And like so I want to give it away, but but I want to find the right person to give to. And you know it's probably gonna happen. That's gonna sit in my in the studio for a month or two till I d- find the right person. What is that? What does that say about me? Those two things. I think that it says a lot of positive things about you. And I think that each day you um, admire the old chair. And each day you thank that old chair for the the comfort that it has brought you, and and you simply say to yourself, it's going to be so great when someone else gets to enjoy this the way that I have, yeah. and that will naturally occur. It'll just start to it'll start to flow. It'll speed up. So right now, um, you know, you're in a month long process, but you can continue to speed that up so that the things that you want come to you um, within you know hours or minutes. Yes. Yeah, you're right. You know, and, and that chair, by the way, that chair has made me millions of dollars. I I, I went from twenty six thousand dollars in debt to you know a three point eight million dollar net worth sitting in that chair. So um, I love that chair. Fantastic. So all right. So uh, speaking of books, real quick, and this is so we're really wrapping up now. So um, uh, we have six minutes left. Um, I'm an aspiring real estate agent. I have twenty five bucks. What book should I go buy today? Well, hmm. Uh, what book should you go buy today? You know, my first instinct um, is my father's book, hmm. um, How to Create a Six-Figure Income in Real Estate. And the the reason why my first instinct is is that is um, very simply that there is a, a basic functionality to real estate that most real estate agents um, don't get because they're – the way that they learn real estate is through the sales meetings and the parade of trainers that come through their office every single month. Yeah. And so they learn real estate in a very hodgepodge, um, thrown together. Uh, you know, have you ever have you ever been to an incredibly um, impoverished area where they they have a shanty town? Where there's just houses are basically, you know, boxes that are put together with a carton that have yeah. a, uh, you know, a hollowed out uh, barrel is, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Yep. Um, when I meet most real estate agents and I, if I'm coaching them in a functionality um, process, typically what I find is their real estate business looks like a shanty town house. Yeah. And what, what my father has done very elegantly is said, here is the exact specs to building an effective real estate business. And I think that having integrity in your systems is one of the things that you must do first and foremost. Yeah, you have to have the foundation. You have to, I agree, have those pillars. And look, and I'll say two things. One, your dad, I, I actually said this probably three weeks ago, but but I would I would bet – um, your dad has probably made more millionaires than maybe just about anybody. I don't know if there's anyone out there who has made more millionaires. Um, you know, may, in the real estate industry for sure. Yeah, for sure. Maybe in the, maybe in the investing industry or something like that. But um, 
Um, in real estate, there's I, I don't think that there's anyone who has been as consistent. And the thing that I appreciate about him so much is that he doesn't change his story based on popularity. Right. He, he, he's, he well, he thrives. He thrives in that. We talked about that when he was on the show. He 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 likes uh, he likes a little bit to argue. Oh my God! Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it it has helped me become the um, uh, kind and humble man that I am. I say to him so often, um, Dad, you were the fire that forged the steel of my blade. Ah, hey, so so really, what, say the name of that book again, because I'm going to give out a link. If, uh, say your dad's book again. It's uh, how to how to make a six figure income selling real estate Got by it. Mike Ferry. And if anybody wants a free copy of that, uh, you can get it through our link, audibletrial.com slash superagentslive. Here's the last question I have for you, Matthew. Um, uh, you are very much like his, the sense of you in the last 57 minutes we've talked to you, this sort of metaphysical guy. I get a lot of different vibes from you, but do you have any personal habits that you use on a, on a daily consistent basis that you feel has contributed to your success? Yeah, I think that the number one habit that I have is the habit of recontextualization. Okay. And that is that is um, the practice of of never believing a single thing that my mind says to me. Because what I've noted is that my mind's job is to survive and therefore it is only pointing out potential danger or um, things that will go wrong. And um, I'm actually trying to thrive. And so to listen to my mind only drives me into things that are um, inaccurate and ineffective. Got it. I love it, man. Hey, Matthew, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I'm going to say thank you. I always encourage my audience to reach out and say thank you. Let everybody know where they can find you. And, and uh, I think you have something coming up uh, that, that you might want to talk about. Yeah, I've got an incredible, incredible free video series that I'm putting out on October 1st at my new product offering called Top Agent Mindset. So if you go to topagentmindset.com, I've got a whole free video series. It's only going to be available for a week. Mm. So you have to um, get in on October 1st. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be gone. And um, I think that people are going to be blown away. I really, I'm just trying to teach people the, the basics of how to get the mindset under control so that you can start functioning at a much higher level. So topagentmindset.com. Got it. Uh, so, and listen, I will have all the stuff on the show notes at superagentslive.com. Go to Matthew Ferry, and if you've missed anything, book recommendation or whatever, um, all the, it will be there on the notes, even if they're not complete because we have our show writers a little bit behind. But I will, I will link to that, Matthew. Hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, let's keep in touch. Uh, thank you so much, Toby. All right, buddy. Thanks, man. Let's go. 